It's Tim Schiesser for TechSpot, and this is the Sony Xperia Z2. We're just barely six months out from the release of the Xperia Z1, and Sony has come out with a new flagship Android device powered by the Qualcomm Snapdragon 801 SoC. It packs a 5.2 inch 1080p LCD display, as well as a 20.7 megapixel rear camera capable of 4K Ultra HD video recording. There's also 3 gigabytes of RAM, 16 gigabytes of internal storage, a 3,200 milliamp hour battery and it's running Android 4.4 KitKat out of the box. Before we get straight into the review, you can click here to view my first impressions of the device and see how they've changed between now and then. And you can also click here to compare the Xperia Z2 to the Xperia Z1, which is something I won't be covering in great detail in this review, instead looking at comparing it to the Galaxy S5 and the HTC One M8. Now it's time to take a look at the design of the Xperia Z2 and it's remained mostly the same as we've seen with the Xperia Z1. That is, it's a very rectangular slate design with not much curvature, dominated of course by the display on the front which takes up a lot of space. There's smaller bezels than what we saw in the past thanks to the 5.2 inch display sort of taking up more of that front panel. But it's still a fairly minimalist design as we look around here. You can see on the back there's not much except for some Sony and Xperia branding and of course you'll find the 20.7 megapixel camera on the top with an f 2.0 lens and the LED flash. You can also see an NFC logo there telling you exactly where you need to tap this device for NFC. On the front is the front facing camera as well as a hidden sensor array and you'll notice at the top here hidden in there is a notification light which is quite bright. Fortunately I haven't got any notification to show you that just at the moment. New to the design of the Xperia Z2 are dual front facing speakers. You can see one in the slit down below and also one at the top meaning that when you turn this device in landscape mode you do get stereo sound output which is great for watching videos and also for gaming. That said, compared to the HTC One M8 over here, the speakers aren't exactly great quality compared to the One M8's fantastic boom sound speakers. That said, dual front facing speakers is better than just a single speaker on the bottom or on the sides of the device like we were used to on the Xperia Z1. Taking a look around the edges of the device and on the right hand side you will notice the circular power button as well as the volume rocker and the two stage camera button which is something we don't often see on Android devices. There's also a micro SD card slot hidden behind this flap which you can take off just like that and inside there you will see the micro SD card neatly hidden away. Meanwhile on the other side you will find the interesting looking dock connector which I'm not a huge fan of. It's sort of indented into the design there. It doesn't exactly look good, it sort of looks like a volume rocker is missing from this side, but it does facilitate an accessory. And you can also see another flap here, which you'll find beneath is the micro USB port, as you can see there for charging and transferring data from the device. Also there's the SIM card slot right there, hidden behind this flap. The flap does get a bit annoying when you're trying to take it off to try and sort of charge the device through that port. It is kind of annoying, but it does seem fairly secure. That said, the flaps do facilitate waterproofing, which means you can dunk this device in up to 1.5 meters of water for 30 minutes and it will survive perfectly fine. On the bottom of the device, you'll find just a few dots for the microphone and also on this side is for charms if you sort of like attaching things to your smartphone. And on the top is the 3.5 mil audio jack as well as another microphone for dual recording. As I mentioned around the device, you'll see some of the things that I mentioned before, including that very impressive camera on the top of the device. So taking a look at this device compared to some other flagships, and you'll see that it's a similar size to the Galaxy S5. It's slightly taller, but you'll notice it's also very similar in width, meaning that it's still quite comfortable to hold both these devices. That said, this one is more curved compared to this one. So while this one is looks a lot better, thanks to that premium construction seeing glass on the front and also glass on the back. It isn't as comfortable to hold as this slightly curved design. The Galaxy S5 is also slightly lighter than the Xperia Z1 thanks to that fantastic construction making it a little bit heavier. You also notice around here the aluminium highlights are actually aluminium compared to the sort of fake look of the Galaxy S5. It's a very similar size, very similar size to the HTC One M8. You notice it's almost exactly the same height and it is just a little bit wider to facilitate that 5.2 inch display. The construction of the One M8 is slightly better. It's got that aluminium feel over the entire device. It's very ergonomic, 
very well curved. The display is also quite nice on that device. That said, there's still a lot of things to like about this Sony Xperia Z2's design. It's If you've loved the design of the Z and the Z1 that came before it, you'll love the design of the Xperia Z2 as well. Just feel that it could be perhaps a little bit slimmer and a bit more ergonomic to hold, but generally no complaints. It is a premium device that packs a premium feel to it. Now it's time to take a look at the display on the Xperia Z2. Finally, Sony has opted to use an IPS LCD display on this, 5.2 inches in size with a resolution of 1920 by 1080. Of course, 1080p, and that equates to a pixel per inch density of around about 425 pixels per inch. So it's quite a dense display, but like I said, the IPS panel resolves a number of serious issues that I had with the Xperia Z1's display. Most notably, the viewing angles on this display, while this isn't coming out particularly great on the camera, the viewing angles on this display are significantly better than they have been in the past. When you are viewing this device on a desk such as here, you can actually view the panel before it simply changed the contrast horribly and you just couldn't see the display whatsoever. This has been completely resolved and also the IPS panel does give it a few extra features, most notably greater color saturation in the panel. You see these icons and things here just on this particular screen look absolutely fantastic. And there's a few marketing terms that they've used such as triluminous display, live color LED that reflect all the different things that they've put into this specific display to make it look better. Some of the sample images that Sony has included on the Xperia Z2 really show off how good the display on this device is. You know some fantastic color balance here. The gamut of the display does exceed sRGB just slightly which means that there can be a small amount of color banding and colors aren't quite as accurate as you get on a display like the Nexus 5 or the LG G2. But that said, this display looks absolutely fantastic in a number of ways. They've really improved how the display looks compared to previous models. And that pixel density, 425 pixels per inch, makes this look absolutely fantastic viewing 1080p images like these. You can notice some of the great color balance that goes on in this display. That said, I am running the display at the moment with the X Reality engine off. And this is a very interesting feature that's been part of Sony displays for quite some time. You notice here if we dive straight into the settings, click down here to display, and at the top, you notice there is a thing here called the X-Reality Engine for mobile. You simply enable that and it does enhance the quality of photos and videos as it says. Now this is an interesting feature because it was necessary on past Xperia devices to make the colors and everything on this display absolutely pop. So if you scroll back a little in this review, you will have seen this photo with the X-Reality Engine turned off and it doesn't look quite as good as it does with the X-Reality Engine turned on. It just sort of bumps the contrast and the quality of the images on this display a lot. So you can notice that it really makes everything pop when you're sort of viewing images and the like. You can especially notice a lot of things with blues. It really does make it look better. That said, it doesn't make things look accurate whatsoever. You can completely throw out accuracy out of the window when you have got the X Reality Engine turned on. Everything that you take on the camera will look significantly better than you get on a calibrated display. And this is normally why I would tend to leave the X Reality Engine off, mainly because it does change the tone and contrast saturation of the display. That said, it, may, it does generally make things look better in the sense that it pops, it makes it look more vibrant. And I know a lot of people like that because it's something that this particular display over here on the Galaxy S5 does quite well. That said, if you're looking for accuracy, you should definitely consider keeping the X Reality Engine turned off. Of course, it is personal preference. It was definitely necessary on past displays to sort of improve some of the oddities with those sort of more crap displays. But definitely on this particular fantastic IPS display, I would keep the x Reality engine off. You can also see a few other things here, such as glove mode. You can use this display with gloves on. You can also adjust the white balance of the display, which is a fairly cool feature, as you can see there. Again, this isn't something that I would typically adjust. And there's a few other things, such as you can double tap to wake the display. If it's turned on, simply double tap, and it will turn on. Again, some of these features do use a bit more battery, so use it at your peril. Now it's time to talk a little bit about the performance of the Xperia Z2. 
As you can see here, it does pack the Qualcomm Snapdragon 801 SoC, which we've talked about before because it is included in the HTC One M8 and Galaxy S5, so nothing too exciting here. It is clocked at 2.27 GHz across its four Crate 400 CPU cores, which is slightly less than we see on these devices, but it doesn't seem to make a huge difference in benchmarks or in general performance. It's also got the Adreno 330 GPU and an LPDDR3 memory controller packing three gigabytes of RAM in this particular device, which does have a slight advantage in that we can scroll all the way back to some of these apps that we've been using before, such as the PlayStation app, and it tends to load them pretty quickly. You notice there that we might have exceeded the limit, but for example, if we go into the Play Store, it does seem to open these apps pretty quickly, which is one of the benefits of having that extra RAM. One of the things that I found interesting about the performance on the Xperia Z2 is that a live wallpaper is enabled by default. Straight out of the box you will get this live wallpaper which as you can see here does change when I tap and do various things. You notice the color changing. It does actually make the performance on the home screens a little bit worse than if you used a static wallpaper and it does decrease the battery life slightly because it does have to power that sort of 3D effect there. That said, I, the performance isn't too bad. You'll generally notice, you know, browsing around the operating system here, loading applications from scratch, for example, if we load maps, that does things extremely quickly. You can browse through things that I haven't even, you know, even touched on this device, for example. Play games is something I haven't loaded. Everything you can see there loads extremely quickly. Browsing widgets, everything like that. It seems to load everything quite quickly. So it's loading some pretty significant 20 megapixel images in this little widget here, which I'll get into in a little bit talking about the camera. But one thing I definitely would do out of the box is simply click here to wallpapers and choose really any of these other wallpapers. I was using this one before. I would generally speaking do that just to save battery and get a little bit more performance out of the home screens on this device. There's also no OK Google on this, meaning that if you want to OK Google, you do have to tap on this and say OK Google, and then it will start, of course, doing that sort of Google search for you. And that is a feature that was integrated into the Galaxy S5. That said, if you wanna see how this, the performance of this device is, you can click straight through to the full written review where we've got some benchmarks available for this device. This is actually browsing old tech spot, so we'll check out a new version of our tech spot redesign, which I hope you're enjoying. You see that my Wi-Fi performance isn't great, but generally speaking, the performance in the browser is fantastic. There's really nothing to complain about at, about the Snapdragon 801 on this device. It's an extremely powerful SoC that crunches through tasks and games like nothing else. One area that I did want to spend some time on though is the software on this device. It is running Android 4.4 out of the box. We can quickly check that through here. You might need to perform a software update straight out of the box, but as you can see there, Android 4.4 straight out of the box with the on-screen buttons which do slightly reduce the screen real estate available from the 5.2 inch display, closer to five inches when you factor in the navigation bars there. But there are some interesting things that Sony has done in the software here. It's not too different from what we saw with the Xperia Z1, but I just think that it's a little bit bland in some of the things that it does. For example, you notice that a lot of these apps are just, they pack some strange gradient options at the top, which doesn't mesh well with sort of stock Android design. You notice things like here, such as we've got here the market application or the Google Play Store. It is completely flat. Everything you can see here is designed for flat. And then you suddenly get into an application such as the alarm that I was showing you before. And it's got these gradients on the top, which just seem a little bit bland and a little bit weird. Same sort of situation with the contacts app and also the messaging app. These applications just look just a little bit boring and there's no added features. It's simply skinning for the sake of skinning. And I don't think that this skin looks as good compared to some of the improvements that have gone to its competitor skin, like the HTC One M8 over here, which has, generally speaking, a quite good skin. It's just some of the, it just seems like it's showing its age a little bit. That's it, some applications have improved for the better. One of them is Calendar, which I think looks really good. You'll see the sidebar over here. You can change it to month mode. You can see it does show uh, the weather for the upcoming days. It also shows birthdays and you can scroll through your agenda, which is quite nice. Same thing for the album application. When you go back into sort of the standard home mode, you can sort of scroll through all your images and see quite a lot of them at once. You can also scroll through some connected devices on the side there. Similar thing with the Walkman app. 
This is quite integrated into Sony's services, so you'll notice that it is integrated into Music Unlimited on the side here. You can view charts, playlists, channels, all sorts of things there. But when you get down to just the general interface, it's just a little bit meh is the best way that I could describe the interface on this device. The strange interface also comes into play when you're talking about the notification pane, which I think is a significant regression from what we saw on the Xperia Z1. That said, Xperia Z1 has actually been updated to look exactly like this in the Android 4.4 up update. Previously, it had quick settings up the top, but these have been delegated over to this extremely strange sort of quick settings panel. You can edit them, so you can add in all sorts of things into there, but it just doesn't look very good. And continually, when I want to go to settings, which you know, see, so you tap there, go straight into the settings. I just kept tapping edit for a long time, and it's just. It's not that good. Another area that isn't so good is the keyboard. As you can see here, it does pack swipe, which is quite nice. But one of the things that I continually manage to do when typing is miss the very small space bar, which as you'll notice here is, it's just too small for what it is. You've got these ridiculous big buttons there. I generally speaking switch to something else if you're using the Xperia Z2. Browsing through the settings and there are a few other interesting things to talk about. You've got personalization options in here. You can control Xperia themes and a few other things such as you can set what status bar items appear at the top there. There's also Xperia connectivity. If you use, you can use a DualShock 3 wireless controller with this device. You can tether it to your computer. You can mirror your screens. You can set it up as a media server. It's quite versatile in that respect. There's also the power management features here. Stamina mode is actually quite good at extending battery life and you've got a few other things here you can do such as location-based Wi-Fi. That said, the 3200 milliamp hour battery in here is very good when it comes to battery life. I find it's quite unusual in that it's not as good on LTE as it is on Wi-Fi. It's extremely good battery life on Wi-Fi, but just a little bit average battery life on LTE, not what I was expecting from a 3200 milliamp hour battery. That said, it's not gonna run out throughout the day. And finally, they're deciding to pack in some significantly large batteries into these devices, which it really does need. So I'm really happy with the battery life on this device. Fairly similar, that said, to the Galaxy S5 and also the HTC One M8. So when it comes to all three of these devices, you generally speaking get very similar battery life. Probably the M8 is the worst and this probably is the best. So but then again, it's all crowded very similarly thanks to the power efficiency of the Snapdragon 801 SoC. So the final area that I want to discuss about the Xperia Z2 is the 20.7 megapixel rear camera on the back of this device. It's a 1 over 2.3 inch sensor, Sony Exmor RS. It's exactly the same sensor as seen on the Xperia Z1 Compact and also the Z1 itself. It's got an f2.0 lens around about 28 millimeters in 35 millimeter terms. It's also got the LED flash there. No optical image stabilization, but that said, there have been some improvements to how this camera performs in low light. So as you notice here, I've chucked a Lego model behind this device just to demonstrate some of the camera features of the Xperia Z2. And there are some things that it hasn't really changed from the Xperia Z1 in terms of its software. You notice here we have both superior auto and manual modes. Superior auto is what's launched in the camera by default, but unfortunately, you simply can't select this to run at 20.7 megapixel images. In fact, it always takes eight megapixel images. So when you sort of focus and take a photo like that, you're gonna get an eight megapixel image in superior auto mode. And it does seem to have the best automatic setting selection, which I find kind of strange that they wouldn't allow you to take 20 megapixel images in its sort of best metering mode. That said, you can switch across to manual mode. And this is sort of where there's some interesting things that come out when you're using 20 0.7 megapixel shooting. So it is a 4.3 sensor, meaning that you can see here that we've got this sort of square mode, and you will have to set that in here to set it to 20.7 megapixels, but you do lose some features. You notice here that you can't take HDR photos in 20 megapixel mode. You can change the ISO, but it tops out at ISO 800, which I think is kind of strange. For example, if we switch back here to eight megapixel, you notice immediately here that HDR mode becomes enabled and ISO goes all the way up to 3200. So it is kind of limited in what the 20 megapixel mode does. 
That said, they have fixed some things. ISO auto mode will automatically choose ISOs above 800 if you are in low light situations. So you can get full resolution low light images that look quite good, especially if you enable the image stabilizer, which I would highly recommend you do because there is no optical image stabilization on this device. But when you're shooting in 20 megapixel mode, you also lose scene selection, which is a feature that you can use in both superior auto mode, which automatically selects scenes for you, or if you're just manually shooting here. And you'll notice there's quite a lot of scenes here. So I think it's kind of unusual that they would restrict some of the features of this device to 20 megapixel mode that you can't do some features, eight megapixel mode you can. I just think that's kind of strange considering the SOC is more than powerful enough to run some of these features, just that it's oddly restricted. Galaxy S5, which has that 16 megapixel camera on the back, has no trouble using all of the features across the full resolution images. You can take 4K video on this device, but you won't find it by default here. You notice that it actually shoots at both full HD at 30 and 60 frames per second. So 30 frames per second, you tend to get a fairly smooth sort of preview. When you switch across to 60 frames per second though, does seem to get a little bit more juddery, which I find kind of interesting. Although that said, it does not translate to final results whatsoever. If you do want to shoot 4K video, you have to switch across to the 4K video shooting mode. Take some absolutely fantastic videos at 4K mode. Of course, Ultra HD, you get a lot of pixels and it does downscale on the display and on most displays that you're sort of used to. So it tends to look absolutely fantastic. You also get time shift video, which is slow motion video. Again, works quite well shooting at 120 frames per second. There's a couple of other features here that I'm not gonna talk in great detail about, including time shift burst, as you'll see there. Info eye, you can take Vine images and the augmented reality effect, which is, to be honest, quite a ridiculous effect. That said, you do get a feature here called background blur, and this is basically, as you can see here, you sort of select an area that you touch to focus on. We'll focus on this sort of wing section. You tap to take focus and it takes the photo at multiple focus points and sort of attempts to blur out the background. That said, it doesn't always work as you can see there, could not blur out the background. That feature does seem to be imitating what we saw on the HTC One M8 with its duo camera that allows you to defocus the images. On a software implementation, it's not quite as good. So it is worth taking a look at some sample shots from the Xperia Z2's camera. Sony claims that this is the best smartphone camera going around, and in some situations I tend to agree. It is fantastic in strong lighting, shows really how good this sensor is, and it gives you absolutely fantastic clarity, and surprisingly good bokeh for a f2.0 lens on a smartphone. It's also quite good at low lights, surprisingly so compared to what happened on the Xperia Z1. No optical image stabilization and pixels that are only 1.12 microns, nothing compared to the HTC One, but it does do a reasonable job. In some other situations, it's a bit iffy when it comes to its metering, especially in moderate lighting conditions and indoors, but that said, most smartphones seem to struggle with these conditions. And there are just some situations where I'm taking a photo and the image just comes out a little bit meh, not quite what I was expecting from this camera, and an area where maybe the Galaxy S5 would do a little bit better in. That said, this is marginally the best camera going around. I'd say if you get the Galaxy S5, you'll be getting also a very solid camera, but it does edge that a little bit in its clarity and also its sort of saturation in most conditions. And that brings us to the end of this review of the Sony Xperia Z2. And I think that this is an extremely interesting smartphone in a number of ways. With the improved display and improved camera, pretty much every aspect of this device is very good. There's a good design that I really enjoy. There's a fantastic display now that it's been fixed with that IPS panel. It's got extremely good performance, Snapdragon 801. It's got good battery life. It's got a really good camera. And of course, it's running Android 4.4 with software that is okay, but not great. So while the Xperia Z2 is very good on a number of fronts, it doesn't have that killer feature or really amazing feature that makes it stand out from the pack of flagship smartphones that are available at the moment. For example, if we look at the HTC One M8, it has that fantastic aluminium design that makes it really stand out, as well as the duo camera. And generally speaking, you can recommend this phone to a lot of people because of that outstanding design. 
With the Samsung Galaxy S5, this phone is really geared towards fitness with the heart rate monitor on the back and the fantastic s application. Also, the display is absolutely phenomenal on this device, really blowing out of the water a lot of other smartphones. And of course, the fingerprint sensor does make it stand out a little bit from the crowd. So as I said before, the Xperia Z2 doesn't have that edge over the smartphones with the killer feature. Sony would tend to think that is the rear camera, but it's not leagues ahead of other smartphones that really makes it stand out. You tend to be very happy with the camera on the Galaxy S5 as well. That said, there is a reason to get the Sony Xperia Z2, and that is that it's a very well-rounded handset. There is no particular area of this device that is particularly poor, and everything is generally quite good across the board. So if you're looking for a very balanced and well-rounded device, the Sony Xperia Z2 is the smartphone for you. And that's it for this review of the Sony Xperia Z2. If you're after a more in-depth look at this smartphone, including benchmarks, camera samples, and more, do check out the full written review. Links to that will be in the description below. You can subscribe to this YouTube channel if you want to get more in-depth video reviews sent straight to your inbox. You can also follow us on Twitter at TechSpot for all the latest in tech. And if you want to ask me any particular questions about the Xperia Z2, you can do so on my personal Twitter feed at ScorpusV. Thanks to everyone for watching. This has been a TechSpot video review.